your fellow mechanics and your fellow team are going to be very, very helpful. Um, what's going on, everybody? Bryce, your favorite AMP IA and Part 147 instructor, back again with another video. And this time, I'm going to be talking about what you can expect when you get your first job in aviation versus reality, as well as a couple things you can do to help get that job in the first place. So before I get too into it, I would like to remind you to join the Discord, leave us a like and leave us a comment. It really helps with engagement and keeping these videos going so that hopefully I can uh, do more giveaways and things and give back to the community. So these are the three biggest things that you can expect and two things you should do. So that's five things total for your first job in aviation. The first thing you should expect is training. Lots and lots and lots of training. When you graduate a part 147 school, and I'm using part 147 for this because if you were working under an apprenticeship program, you've probably already gone through your training. And what I mean by that is in order to get your AMP with an apprenticeship, you have to work somewhere for three years to meet the eligibility requirements to then go test. If you've worked somewhere for three years, they're probably just gonna turn you loose to do whatever it is they need you to do. But if you went through a part 147 school or a part 147 program, you will be expected to sit through weeks of training. And by weeks of training, I mean classroom, death by PowerPoint, possibly some OJT training in which they will fully brief you on the airframe or component that you're going to be working on. For example, if you were working in a jet engine overhaul facility on a CFM 56, you're going to go through some pretty intense training on the CFM 56 before they just turn you loose working on that engine. Same thing if you go to work for Boeing and they want you to work on the on the 737s, you're going to get training on the 737s before they just turn you loose working on the 737. One of my concerns that I hear the most from students is that they're just going to be expected to know everything when they graduate and go out in the field and ultimately it's just it's not true. You're going to be trained on whatever it is that you're going to be working on. And that can also be said, even if you're already working somewhere and you transition to another airframe or you transition to another job, you're gonna have to go through all of your training all over again. The second thing you can expect. Now, this has always been true in the past, but it not, might not be as true now, just because of how demanding the industry is for new mechanics. There is quite a shortage but you could typically always expect to kind of get the less desirable shifts and the less desirable work. One, your supervisors and your people around you are not going to trust you just yet to do a whole bunch of work on your own, but two, the people who want to work day shift and the people who want to work the best schedules are the people that have been there the longest. So it wasn't uncommon to have to go to regional hubs like Atlanta or Austin or the larger airports for the hub for that regional airline to get all of your first couple years of experience and it wasn't uncommon to work second or third shift. Now it's a little different. They are hiring mechanics for first shift um, right out of school just because there is such a demand and they are off also offering really good hiring bonuses. So if you're thinking about starting a job as an aircraft mechanic, believe me, now is certainly the time. And if you're in school getting ready to finish, you are ready to strike, get your AMP as soon as you can. The third thing that I want you to expect is that when you first start your job, at least in my experience, the people around you, your fellow mechanics and your fellow team are going to be very, very helpful. Um, aircraft mechanics on the whole, again, in my experience, are very kind, very polite people and you're not going to get roasted for not knowing something. At the end of the day, we're all trying to deliver the aircraft safely and on time to its destination or to whoever it needs to get delivered to. So the people on your team are not going to turn around and be like, oh, you're such an idiot because you didn't know something. You just started. It's not uncommon that you don't know things. So by all means, what you should be doing is looking left and looking right and leaning on your team and the people around you for as much help as possible. Now, obviously, if after a year you don't know how to torque something, that's a little bit of a problem and you're probably going to get laid off from whatever job that is. But up front, your team members are going to be very helpful to help you find the things you need, where, where tools are, where parts are, and procedures, and that kind of thing. And you're probably also going to be assigned a, a mentor or sort of an apprenticeship up front anyways. 
So even though you are turned loose to do whatever it is that's needed done on the aircraft, you're still going to be shadowing and helping a more senior mechanic in the beginning of your shift. So now onto the second part of the video, which is the two things that you can do to help get you that job in the first place. And the first one has to do with the application process. Now, I've noticed a lot of my students, they apply for a bunch of jobs and they don't even get looked at. And this is often because, especially civil service, but it's also true for um, more major companies. This is often because companies use computers to sift through resumes. What I mean by that is if there is a job experience requirement list, and that list says that you must have experience with uh, non-metallic structures or composites, you must have experience with troubleshooting electrical circuits, right? All of those things need to be in your resume somewhere, even if all you did was do them at school. Under your education and schooling, you could put, you know, went through part 147 school, whatever, we'll use some fake, <clears throat> we'll use some fake school that doesn't exist, we'll call it Bryce's Aviation College, right? You should put that and then um, under school experience, list all of the things that are on that job experience requirement form, right? And every single thing I would list third person personally. So if it says, you know, must have experience with aircraft sheet metal, put has experience with aircraft sheet metal, comma, has experience troubleshooting um, wiring diagrams, has experience, has experience, has experience. If you are missing any of those things, often when you submit your resume, the computer is going to look at your resume, see that you're missing keywords, and immediately it's gonna kick it out. Even though you have that experience, and you might be a very qualified mechanic, and you might be possibly the best mechanic for that job, if you can't get past the computer, you're never going to get an interview. Which leads me to my final point in the video, which is your interview. For your interview, it is important to understand that you are probably interviewing with other mechanics. You are interviewing with people who have been working on the line, and even if they don't say that, they might just say they're a supervisor, or they might say, oh, I'm the hiring manager, and you know this is Phil. Well, Phil might be one of the supervisors on the aircraft that they are hiring you to work on. And you need to understand that what you don't want to do is start BSing your interview. You want to be honest and you want to make yourself out to be the most qualified candidate, yes, but you want to be honest in what you can and can't do. If you go in and you start kind of, you know, talking a bunch of, of noise on what you can do and are trying to BS the interview process, the supervisor is probably going to see right through that and you're not going to have that good of a chance. So it's actually more impressive to say, well, I went through school here and we did this, we did that, we, we practiced this NDI, we practiced this and we practiced that, so I have experience with it. And you're more likely to get hired than if you go in trying to sound like you have a whole bunch of experience that you don't actually have. Thanks again for watching, everybody. That's pretty much gonna do it for this video. As always, I hope you found this information helpful. Um, leave us a like, leave us a comment, subscribe, go build something, and be easy.